It's an honor, as always, to have you here with us, uh, Air Chief. I want to begin by asking you a question about our future and the young talent that you are training, the Agnipat scheme. Now, according to the statistics that were widely reported, the IAF actually received the highest ever recruitment registration due to Agnipat, nearly seven and a half black candidates registered. How's that going, sir? How do you look at this development? And uh, what's your assessment of how the Agnipat initiative has actually progressed? The uh, Agnipat scheme, which was launched uh, last year, I think has been a watershed moment in the recruitment process across the armed forces. Uh, when it comes to the Air Force, you'll agree that uh, the Air Force is primarily a skill-based service where each uh, individual in the service is expected to have some sort of technical or psychomotor skill. And for this, we've realized that uh, the younger generation can be very easily channelized if they're given the, uh, the correct direction. And this Agnipit Path scheme has given us a new opening to relook at our training processes and uh, the way we um, make them adapt for the future. So to give you an example, um, this year, we, we have had about over 9 lakh applicants. We took in close to 3,000 uh, young boys into, this, uh, into our training center. And uh, tomorrow morning, they're going to graduate the first batch. The next batch will start after a couple of weeks. And the next batch will also have the first women Agni Veers in the Air Force. When it comes to um, what, what has changed, we realized that when we have a short period of engagement with them and a very short training period, we need to make the best of every minute available with us. So we started with what we call skill mapping. So we mapped every individual and we've identified what he is skilled in. For example, it is mandatory for all our airmen to know some amount of English, some computer skills and so on. So now when we identified that these some people have already got the requisite skills, so the time which we were taking earlier to train them on these skills is now utilized for training them on something else. So this has been a revolutionary way of, uh, you know, it is given an opportunity to relook at our training, and I think it is going to pay us huge dividends in the years to come. Well, Air Chief Chaudhary, we are looking at the future where you have to obviously talk about modernization. How is that going? We are so dependent on infrastructure that comes from foreign countries, uh, specifically Russia. Um, but there's been talk that we will perhaps be now manufacturing here. We're going to get engine technology from United States, the GE engines. And uh, how's that going towards uh, building Atmanir Bharta? Indigenization, as we know it, is, uh, is a mandatory step for uh, achieving what is called strategic autonomy. And uh, in particular, indigenization of defense equipment is something that we should continue to keep our focus on. And I think uh, the steps that we have taken in the last uh, few years have been very, very positive. When it comes to what the Air Force has done in particular, uh, if I have to spell out the ABCs of indigenization, I will use the same abbreviation. We call it the ABCD of indigenization. A for acquisition, B for boosting, C for conserving, and D for developing. So when it comes to acquisition, you're aware that we've signed numerous contracts in the last few years. When it comes to uh, the um, fighter aircraft, we've got the LCA already inducted. We've signed the contract for the LCA Mark 1A. We've got the... Um, helicopters, the advanced light helicopters, and the light com uh, combat helicopters. Similarly, the surface-to-air guided weapons, radars, and a host of other ground equipment and weapons are all going to be indigenized, and our acquisition is going to be based on indigenous equipment. The second step, like I said, is to boost the existing capability. You know, we had procured a lot of equipment and platforms in the last couple of decades, which at that time were top of the line. But as time has gone by, we need, we need to continuously upgrade the equipment. 
for example, the Sukhoi 30. We have now equipped it with the Brahmos, with the Astra missile, with our own homegrown electronic warfare equipment. So also with the other fighters like the Mirage 2000 or the MiG-29, the helicopter fleets have all been upgraded with indigenous equipment. Then comes the conserve part of it. We have equipment and aircraft which are almost half a century old, but we need to keep them going because they are still very potent. Conservation of such old equipment, particularly where the OEMs, most of them are foreign OEMs, they have shut shop many years ago. Spares are hard to find. So we had taken up this process of indigenization of these spares some years ago. And um, over 60,000 spares, small to large spares of all varieties, have been indigenized in the last five or six years. So this is a huge step towards conserving our old assets, our vintage uh, equipment. So are you saying that you no longer need to depend on foreign imports for these older planes? I presume you're talking about the MiGs, the MiG-21s? Yeah. Primarily that. There, there may be still one odd component which is, uh, it may not be cost effective to produce in India, but majority of the equipment is being manufactured and uh, procured from Indian sources. And um, the last step towards Indianization is of course design and development, wherein we uh, work hand in hand with DRDO, with the defense PSUs, with uh, ADA and other uh, establishments for the development of future technologies, future assets that we are going to procure. And uh, our aim is that in the next uh, decade or so, most of the ground equipment, be it the radars, surface to air guided weapons, or any other networks primarily, are, will be 100% indigenized. Why has it taken us so long to develop our own jet engine technology? We've, you know, sent um, uh, rockets up to space. We've done just about every bit of innovation. We're cutting-edge science. But in this one sector, why, why, what do you put it down to? Lack of political will? But what is it? No, no. You know, jet engine technology is probably the most uh, difficult technology to, to master. So far, there are only a few nations and a few companies which have mastered uh, production of jet engines. Uh, we really cannot compare it to a rocket engine because that is more of a one-time um, use rocket, whereas this has to undergo thousands of cycles of extreme heat and extreme stress. So it is a technology which we have made a large number of, uh, you know, we have taken a large number of steps through GTRE's Kaveri program. But um, I think we have not been able to reach a finality in that program. And uh, if we have some hand-holding, I'm sure we can also make our own engine. Is it because we didn't open up to the private sector early enough and depended on perhaps just one agency? That could be one reason. But primarily, like I said, the, we needed some kind of hand-holding, somebody to take us through the difficult steps of uh, building our technology, particularly the core engine technology. So um, the uh, demand for aero engines primarily would have been from the Indian Air Force. And if the um, demands, the numbers were not too high, I don't know how many private players would have come into the fray. How closely are you working with uh, Indian private sector companies now, aeronautical companies, manufacturing, OEM manufacturing companies, etc.? How we, wide is the engagement is the question. We, we, we have opened up, firstly, uh, we have opened up all our doors for all Indian private uh, enterprises to come and see what we have got, where they can pitch in. We go to most of these uh, private sector industries to see what they can make for us. Uh, what you primarily see are the aircraft and aeroplanes which, uh, which make a visible impact. But actually behind the scenes when it comes to networks, electronic warfare equipment and a whole lot of things which are not readily visible to people are all being sourced from Indian private industries. So you're obviously boosting this indigenous technology to take up challenges. And one such challenge comes from uh, China, China's investment in air infrastructure at the border. Uh, air Chief, since 2020, after the Galwan Valley clash, both India and China have engaged in a border standoff. It's well publicized. We've reached a point of intractability in some sectors. Now, according to a report by Center for Strategic and International Studies, the CSIS, 
the Chinese have newly constructed or upgraded at least 37 airports and heliports within Tibet and Xinjiang region since 2017. And this is easily verifiable. Also, the PLAAF has uh, increased its deployment of aerial assets near the border. How is the Indian Air Force uh, boosting its own aerial cap capabilities and capacities to meet this challenge? Let me begin by assuring you that uh, we are always on 24-7 readiness to take on any challenge. We are fully aware of uh, the developments that are taking place across our northern borders. We keep, uh, you know, uh, regular surveillance over what is happening there. And our uh, acquisition and our deployment philosophy is always based to counter such kind of threats that are likely to emerge from there. Uh, after the Galwan crisis in um, 2020, our primary aim was to enhance our surveillance in that area to actually see what is happening across the border. So we had to deploy a large number of uh, radars of all sizes in that area. Uh, we had to bolster it by deploying surface-to-air guided weapons. We had to redeploy our fighter aircraft, which were some of them were based in the uh, interior of the country. We had to move them up north. So we had taken all measures to ensure that our presence was felt and it was in deterrence to the uh, adversary. Uh, the primary issue that hit us at that time was maintaining a steady logistics chain in such kind of an environment. So this we overcame by having a good kind of fuel bridging, good understanding with uh, the army and the other paramilitary forces which are deployed there in terms of uh, kitting and rations and so on, creating habitats for our people. Uh, another big challenge was that um, very few of our uh, air warriors had ever been deployed at such high altitude for such prolonged durations. So acclimatization of our personnel was also a huge challenge. And uh, that time in 2020, uh, we were really skeptical about how we would overcome the harsh winters. But now three years down the line, three winters down the line, I think we have created adequate infrastructure. We have um, ensured logistic supplies are available and um, adequate deployment of all our assets are there to have a credible deterrence in that area. Are we up to the levels that we need to be to counter a Chinese threat at the border? That's a very uh, difficult question to answer straightforward yes or no because um, there are many variables in that but suffice it to say that yes we are continuously upgrading our capability and um, changing our tactics and techniques and procedures to be able to handle the threat. Is there a gap? And uh, if there is, how much? Uh, like I said, I cannot really quantify the gap, but the gaps will always remain. Wherever there's a gap in technology, we overcome it with better tactics. Wherever there's a gap in numbers, we overcome it with better technology and so on. So there is always a counter to something that is happening across. Okay, let me ask you, because um, there is this concern about the depleting Air Force squadron. And we've had conversations about this. So Air Chief, India continues to face these threats from adversaries. In fact, there is always this theoretical possibility of a two-front war. Uh, as of now, as per reports, the IF, and correct me if I'm wrong, has 32 squadrons against the mandated 42. So in, in what capacity are we building up to ensure this gap is met, this mandated gap is closed, and secondly, that uh, we also acquire the best capacities, the best aircrafts, and how long will it take? The acquisition process has, uh, is uh, always, you know, the wheels are always churning. We have uh, initiated the case, like I said, for um, five, six quadrants of the LCA Mark 1A, we have committed ourselves for procuring equal number of squadrons of the ALC Mark II and subsequently the AMCA. So these are the homegrown uh, fighter aircraft that will meet our requirements in the next two decades and more. Uh, the shortfall in the uh, next generation aircraft will also hopefully be overcome by uh, make in India of and proven fighter aircraft. So we are keenly looking forward to having some kind of, uh, you know, the process moving faster so as to have one of the uh, next generation aircraft being made in India. 
Well, Air Marshal, drones, and we've seen them in different theaters. We saw them in the conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia recently. And now we're getting more reports of how they're sort of disrupting uh, set battlefield tactics, even in the Ukraine-Russia uh, theater. So, uh, and we're seeing, obviously, a lot of drone activity from across the LOC in Pakistan, where we're constantly seeing consignments of uh, weapons and drugs and all of that. What's the strategy adopted by the Air Force to neutralize drone-related threats from our adversaries? Firstly, uh, you know, the proliferation of drones across the spectrum is well known because of their versatility and ease of manufacture and so on. So uh, there is nothing we can do to uh, really control the proliferation of these drones. We have uh, been associated very closely with the Ministry of Civil Aviation and Home Affairs for drafting the drone rules in 2021 and uh, creating flying and no-flying zones for the drones. We have uh, assisted in many ways in helping the drones which are being used by our Indian-owned uh, entities for any reason that they want to use them. We have always been helpful in ensuring that they get the clearances. The problem that you mentioned is of the drones, enemical drones which come from across the border or could be launched from within the country. It's a big challenge to identify and to be able to uh, pick up these drones. We have taken the lead firstly in training the paramilitary forces. We have trained them in um, how to observe, how to pick up, identify, how to report drones, in which direction they're going and so on. And uh, so far we have trained over 10,000 uh, men of the paramilitary forces. Our own acquisition process is underway to get um, drone detection systems and counter drone systems. When you say counter drone, we are looking at all possibilities, whether it is hard kill, soft kill, directed energy weapons, and so on. So we have already procured a large number of counter drone systems, but um, how much is enough is a big question. Well, I'll give you an idea how much is enough. In 2020, drone sightings, India-Pakistan border, 80. 2021, 105. 2022, 323. And there's one statistic which... Uh, actually is quite alarming. According to the BSF, from March 19th to April 15th, and we're talking about this March 19th and April 15th, 10 incidents were reported in which the drone sneaked into the Indian territory from the Pakistan side and only one was uh, actually downed. So nine came through bearing all sorts of consignments. Uh, so clearly we're not up to the challenge. No, uh, we, we have started taking the necessary steps. Like I said, it will take time to start filling up the gaps. The uh, proliferation of these drones available with um, uh, international uh, forces is taking place more rapidly than the counter drone systems are being inducted. But soon this gap will be closed. Okay, we have your assurance to go by, but uh, weaponization of space and space command. Let's talk a little bit about that. I know it's a sort of freewheeling conversation, but... I think if we just talk about these issues, it would be interesting. Um, Air Marshal, space is called as the fourth frontier of war. That's what everyone now sort of likes to call it. Uh, Anti-satellite knocking out capabilities have been demonstrated. Even India demonstrated it, uh, I think, just before the last Lok Sabha elections. The Prime Minister came and sort of announced that in quite dramatic fashion. And we saw a video and all of that. Um, in June 2019, the DSRO uh, was uh, assigned to scale up and develop sophisticated space warfare weapon systems and technologies. My question to you is, how, in, how is India enhancing its uh, technical capabilities to deter its adversaries from, in one sense, colonizing uh, outer space? Space will always remain congested, contested, and... Uh, coveted. Coveted, yeah. yes. So um, everybody wants a share of the pie, of the space pie. The uh, space-faring nations are contesting for spaces in every orbit. The, uh, everybody understands the, um, the dependence on space-based assets 
is very large, not only for civilian purposes, but for military. The Air Force, for example, depends very largely on space-based assets. And we are also cognizant that denial of any space-based application is going to disrupt the way we function to a very large extent. So it is true not only for the military, even for the civil, because we are growing more and more dependent on space-based assets and applications. So protection and defense of our uh, space-based assets is going to be is quite you know important for us, and this is something that we need to start planning for. When it comes to um, space control, again, most of the um, spacefaring nations would seek to ensure that they retain control over space-based assets to be able to have your own assets in place at the time and place of your choosing, and deny the same to the adversary. So. Uh, that, that is an, uh, the, the ultimate aim that we should also be looking at, to have at least limited space control over our area of um, interest. What's the current status with the formation of the Space Command? Because to do all of this, you'll require some sort of... See, we have taken the first step by setting up the Defense Space Agency. It's a tri-services um, setup, led now for the time being by the Indian Air Force. And um, as the space assets grow and our capability and our prowess grows, I'm sure this space uh, agency will also continue to grow and morph into an ultimate space command sometime. Well, let me just quote you because you said the race to weaponize space has already started. And the day is not far when our next war would spread across all domains, land, sea, air, cyber, and space. So we'll talk about cyber in just a few moments. But on the question of space, how have we, in some ways or the other, indemnified ourselves against attack from the heavens, so to speak? We, we all understand that, uh, like you mentioned, in any multi-domain conflict, uh, a weakness in any one domain can be overcome by strength in another domain. So as long as we um, anticipate where our likely weakness is and we acknowledge that we are not so strong in some domain, then we continue to focus our energies on another domain which can counter this. So uh, that is how it is, uh, the, the game is played out all the time. Let's talk a little bit about artificial intelligence that has brought transformational changes in the, in, in the working really of all forces and perhaps in society around us. What role do you think that AI would play in meeting the future objectives of uh, the Indian Air Force? I mean. There are AI-related technologies already there. There's the UAVs, there's UCAVs, and the like. We have uh, recognized the importance of um, AI in every field, and uh, our plans definitely cater for utilizing the prowess of AI, whether it is in um, our ground-based systems, in uh, decision-making and decision support systems, and like you mentioned, more importantly, the futuristic uh, manned, unmanned teaming, which will uh, utilize AI to its uh, fullest capability. So here is where we are cooperating very closely with uh, the defense labs and the uh, defense PSUs for development of unmanned aircraft, which will team with manned aircraft in future. Well, let's talk about the fifth domain of warfare, which is at par with the other domains. And we are now talking about cyber warfare, and we've seen the disruptive power of cyber warfare. We're routinely reading about how Russia sort of tries, or China does, or the West does in different domains, uh, disrupt the functioning of their adversaries, military setup, etc. Now, does the IF have any plans or strategy to build cyber warfare capacities and capabilities on its own? Definitely we have, but... Uh... If you will excuse me, Rahul, I will not like to um, speak on this because most of it remains in the very classified domain. But suffice it to say that, yes, we are developing capabilities. So we should be re rest assured or should we? Yes, please be rest assured. Okay, please be rest assured. Theater Command, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, Emasha, let me take you to the theaterization of the armed forces. Uh, with the evolving nature of warfare, the late CDS, General Bipin Rawat, envisaged, and he talked about it very passionately from this stage, um, an idea of theater command. Now, there was talks of setting up four theater commands, in which the first wave involves the creation of air defense command, 
and Maritime Theater Command. In July 2022, you said that the creation of Air Defense Command would be counterproductive because air defense operations are inextricably linked with all offensive operations, unquote. What's the best possible solution that you could offer to perhaps effectively optimize our resources? There is no doubt that uh, integration and jointmanship is the way forward. And um, here I must assure you that we are working together with the other two chiefs, with the CDS leading the way. And uh, we, are, we have been weighing every option that is available to us. We are weighing the pros and cons of every option. And uh, it may be a bit premature to uh, even announce or say what, what options are being decided because we'll wait for them to be crystallized before we make it public. But uh, let me assure you that work is in progress and uh, something should crystallize soon. So, Emma, should you're saying that you no longer think that it would be counterproductive? No, I, I stand by what I said that time, that a standalone air defense command is counterproductive. Because we really do not have the assets to segregate between what is going to be used for air defense or for offensive ops or, or any other operations. Uh, considering the versatility of our platforms and the flexibility that air power offers, it may not be, uh, and the kind of resources we have today, we may not be in a position to create a standalone air defense command. So that is what I had mentioned last year. On the final subject of arm imports, now, according to um, CIPRI, which is the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, India continues to remain the biggest arms importer. Between 2018 and 2022, India accounted for 11% share of total global arms imports. Russia accounted for 45% of India's imports. It saw a significant decline in share of total Indian arm imports from 64 to 45%, as we know. Shouldn't India start focusing on diversifying its arms import market? instead of relying on just one country or perhaps another two? No, the solution to this lies in getting Atman Nirbhar. And uh, it's an uh, unfortunate uh, pole position that we hold for being the largest importer. And we should get away from it by um, manufacturing our own arms within our own country. So the solution lies there and not in diversifying the vendor base uh, abroad. So if I were to ask you layman question, where should we really focus our energies first in this context? What would you say? I, I think we have uh, now the academia, the industry, the private public sector, the research labs, everybody are now, I think, working in concert today. We understand that maintaining and gaining of strategic autonomy is very important for us. The conflict, ongoing conflicts in Europe has also taught us that long wars will necessitate that we have to be completely self-reliant. So I think all our energies are focused there and we hope to see that uh, this, we will come down from this 11% figure very shortly. Well, Air Chief, it's been uh, lovely speaking to you. Thank you very much for being a part of this uh, <laughs> gathering here and thank you for the full house. Everybody, thank you. thank you very much for your patience. Thank you.